Hey everyone, Aaron and Winston is just in the corner here. If I can get my little tripod. Hey. So this is the Winnie Bago, named after that little nugget over there. You can hear it nibbling in the background. Um, this is my 1992 GMC Vandura box truck edition. Uh, the reason I chose this model was because when I heard I was getting rent evicted and I needed a backup plan, I had a um, Dodge Grand Caravan, which is sweet. They're great camping vehicles, but I wanted something low key and I kind of fell down the rabbit hole, which you are likely doing now, which is how you found this video. Uh, types of conversion you can do, uh, particularly stealth campers, which I knew I would be living and working in this thing and I had to be low key. So when I discovered box trucks were a thing, I didn't even know what a box truck was. You see them all over. It's basically a, a U-Haul, which, you know, once it's, it's like a, a buying a car, you now see them everywhere because they exist everywhere. It's how 90% of businesses operate, which is the beauty of it because people see a white box truck and they don't bat an eye. They're so common and that's why they're wonderful because they are just bland and boring, which is exactly what we want. There's people who do murals on the sides of the vehicles, do stickers. I've seen some gorgeous conversions and that's awesome for them, but I'm trying to hide in the city, be low key. I don't want to knock on my door. I don't want to stand out. I don't want people to know that there's a camper inside this. Aside from this window, outside, you virtually can't tell that anyone's in there. And I keep this light off um, at night. It's very, very important that I remain stealth. So when I found out about box trucks and all the things you can do with them, I thought, why not? So I'm going to go over a quick video of the pros and then eventually the cons of box trucks. So if you look, there are no curved walls. Van sprinters, they're all awesome. They're super cool to each their own. And depending on how you want to use it, if you're a ski bum and you just want a place to sleep, even a car, cars are great for sleeping if you can get the right model. Um, I saw a marketplace posting the other day, someone selling a Honda Fit. They fit a motorcycle in the back of that thing. This is like a regular car and they showed a photo of a regular motorcycle in it, which is sweet. Like you can make anything into a vehicle. It's sad that it's kind of come to this point where it used to be the adventurers and the digital nomads, but with the cost of living and housing crisis, I'm a perfect example. I got rent evicted. So this, it's an attainable, achievable thing that a lot of people can do to be able to just have some sort of housing on your own terms. So in my roundabout way, the number one point of a box truck is a box. It's easy to build in. I have never built anything more than a shelf in my life. And I made this. It's not professional. You know, the the roof isn't done. It's insulated. I, I put up all this stuff myself. I built my bed. Let me get this over here. Um, all this, the shelving underneath. Um, and it was learn as I go. But a box truck is a box, and it makes it super simple. Where you just grab some two by fours, um, some insulation, some uh, plywood, and you can have a basic livable shelter. And the second thing about box trucks, because they are so common, they can be quite cheap. I'm not knocking Sprinter vans, but those are like 60, 70, 80 K. Even used, I, again, with demand and the housing crisis, the prices go up. So I've seen used Sprinter vans, even though it's a diesel, which apparently lasts forever, with 375 K, they have check engine light on, and people want 14 grand for them on the marketplace, which is nuts. So I got this bad boy. I'll show you the outside in a bit. She's not the prettiest but she has 230,000 kilometers. I don't know what that is in miles. Um, she runs well. She's a beast on gas. That is one huge downside of box trucks, depending on the model you pick up. They could be an absolute B on gas. But for the most part, they're cheap. Obviously get a mechanic to look at it, but this was 4,500 bucks. I had to put about $2,000 into it. Um, the brakes do need some work. The build, it was a rush. I'd probably say 2,500 to three grand. A lot of that is my solar setup. Um, thankfully, lumber is still expensive, but with COVID 
kind of dying down. It's not nearly as bad as it used to be. I'd say for actual hard materials, including insulation, a thousand ballpark, maybe a little more between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars. So for six, seven, eight grand, you can have a place to live. And the third point is we'll go on a tour outside, but they're stealthy. They're everywhere. They exist all over. You don't, like I said, you don't take a second look at a box truck. You just think, oh, somebody's moving. And also for parking, again, people move all the time. If you had an actual, even had an actual U-Haul truck, that would fit even better. Especially if you want to park in hotel parking lots. People move all the time. They stay in hotels. As long as you're low key, you know, don't have music blaring. Um, the top fan can be a dead giveaway. But again, most people are not looking 12, 13 feet in the air on these things. As long as you kind of remain low key, you're good. So this is my camper from the outside. Um, other than the door, like I said, it's just a plain old boring looking box truck. I've got the dualies. Um, in the back, I've got lift gate, which I do not need as a bunch of heavy weight that I need to get rid of. And really, like I said, other than the window, which I've seen people cover it with a grate, but I accept it as what it is. Um, obviously this thing is ugly as sin, but for the most part, it just looks like a regular box truck from the outside. Downsides of a box truck. As I mentioned, gas. A lot of them are meant for highway driving. They get good efficiency once they get rolling. For stop and start, like I do, I live in the city. I can't afford to do my road trip yet. I'm still, I want to have a bit, bit be more mechanically sound. Canada is around 7,000 kilometers wide and I plan on going coast to coast. So we're staying here. I'm fortunate that I have a job that I can save money, that I can make things happen. And once we get all fixed up, we're going to hit the road. So that'll be really cool. But even just driving 10 minutes to my job, if that in minimal traffic, I'm probably spending 60, 70 bucks a week on gas, which if you've driven a truck before, it probably isn't that big of a deal, but I drove a Pontiac G7, which was fuel sipping. This thing has a 5.7 liter engine. It is a beast. And like I said, it's from the nineties, so it adds up. One massive downside, and this may depend on where you live, something I was shocked about, and this happened after I bought it. I bought it, I went to register it, I called up my insurance company, I'm like, they're like, what's the VIN? I'm like, do, 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 do. Give it to me again. Do, 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 do. Are you sure it's the right one? Yep. Is that a commercial vehicle? No, I'm buying it. I'm not starting a moving company. I'm, I'm trying to have a place to live. Most box trucks are classified as commercial. It doesn't matter what you want to use it for. They don't care if you're using it to live in, whether it's going to sit in your driveway, whether you're going to start a trucking business. You need to have commercial insurance, which if you don't have much of a record, especially in that area, it can be quite expensive. Um, just during the build, while I was sitting in my driveway, not moving anywhere, it was about 230 bucks a month. This all depends fully on your driving record, um, your history, but that can be a bit of a barrier. Once you get it converted to a camper, it will go down significantly, and I'm in the process of doing that, but realistically, it does make sense. I, with a normal Class 5 license, most people can drive these with their regular license. This is a 5,000 pound plus heavy vehicle. This can do a lot of damage if I'm not paying attention, if I'm driving distracted, if there's a mechanical failure, if my brakes go. If I hit someone, they're probably not walking away and their car might be a write-off. So understandably, insurance can be a lot more expensive. So before you go off on your big road trip around the world, just make sure you know the costs and what the regulations are and what the process is to get your vehicle, once it's converted, um, changed and designated as an RV or a camper. And kind of piggybacking off that point, as awesome as this thing is to drive and be basically invisible in most places, there are places it physically can't go. I generally either need to take up two full parking spots. I don't take up the whole thing, but this will not fit in one with the tail gate hanging off. It's about four or five feet into the lot if I just pulled into a regular parking spot. So generally you have to take up two spots. Um, or if you're one of those, you know, 
there's the grasses here. You can back it in where the ass of it is hanging over and you have more room. And I don't really see why this would be this big of an issue, but as I mentioned in a previous short, height. You are not used to driving a vehicle this tall. This thing is about 12 feet ballpark with the solar panels, which don't go up that much. But um, I remember one of the first times driving this around the neighborhood, just parking on a, a side street. Thankfully, I was going quite slow. All of a sudden, the entire thing shook. And I'm glad I just changed my underwear because I probably would have needed a new pair. But I hit a branch of a tree that was hanging down. It wasn't low hanging. It was just a normal tree. But the corner of the box hit it and it shook the entire vehicle. And if I'd gone, been going much faster, it would have been really bad news. I don't know which would have lost because this thing's pretty beefy. But I don't know who would have won, the truck or the tree. But that's something to be aware of. And just little stuff like parking garages, bridges. A vehicle this size generally can make it under most bridges. We're not driving a big rig. We're not driving an 18 wheeler. We're pretty much okay in the height department, but it is something you now need to be aware of because unless you want a can upper effect happening on your beautiful camper, you really need to pay attention. And I guess one more thing is just comfortability. Um, a lot of people may not be comfortable driving a vehicle this size. I know it was a big step up for me. I've driven bigger vehicles in the past. I'm comfortable with them. Um, but I went from driving a little bitty Pontiac to this bad boy and it's just an adjustment. And some people, I don't care how long you've been doing it, you might not feel comfortable because again, potential damage and just it's unwieldy. And if you can afford a Sprinter or that's what you want, go for it. If you want to camp in a little mini car, do that too. Um, the beautiful thing with this whole camper world is you can pretty much turn anything into a camper, whether it be a teardrop camper or a big bad boy like this. So I hope I wasn't too rambly. Uh, I tried to make this as concise as possible, but I have ADD and I just go off on tangents. So um, if you have any questions, uh, concerns, anything about the process, let me know down in the comments and uh, give me a like and a follow if you like what I'm doing.